go ahead and get started. Uh, getting a little bit of a late start, so uh, we've got a lot of verses to cover today. Um, might have to marathon, marathon through some of it, but, uh, or sprint through some of it, rather. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, it's great, great to be with y'all this morning. I haven't met you. I'm Seth, uh, Seth Carroll. Um, I also wanted to say, just in general, uh, how great it is to be having adult Sunday school again. Uh, I know many of you probably came to us after COVID or during COVID. Um, so this is uh, the first time in, in a long time it feels like we've, we've gotten back to our normal schedule. And I think this adult Sunday school class is such a special and important part of our church. Um, so Nick has done a wonderful job the past month teaching and, um, you know, for such a uh, the, a church our size, we're blessed with many great, capable teachers. Uh, you may not count me among them after hearing you today, but uh, that, that's okay. Even without me, uh, we're still well equipped uh, with so many wonderful, wonderful teachers. Um, so Nick alluded to it uh, in, in the past few weeks that uh, this is not a, a new study I'm beginning. This is a study I'm picking up. Uh, I actually started this class back in January of 2020, uh, over two years ago. A lot is. A lot has changed since January 2020, right? Uh, back then, we didn't know what coronavirus was. Uh, on a personal note, my wife and I were not yet outnumbered by our children. Uh, uh, a lot has changed uh, in our lives. Uh, so I began the study, I think, right after the new year. We got through a couple weeks. And my wife did have our third, our third son. Uh, then we had a business meeting the following week after that. Got through six weeks of lessons. And then we were going to take a break for the mission <coughs> So the missions conference is coming up in the first week of April. We were doing that in spring of 2020. Some of you who were here, remember? We didn't have that missions conference. But that week was uh, the week where really the whole nation uh, went on, on COVID lockdown. So uh, here, two years later, man, finally feels like we're somewhat back to normal. And I'm grateful to pick this, uh, pick this study back up with you. So what are we studying? Uh, this is Jesus' farewell discourse, or it's often called his upper room. Discourse, John chapter 14, 15, and 16. This is Jesus. He's with the disciples at the, the Last Supper, the night before the crucifixion. Uh, and then we're also going to look at John chapter 17, which is Jesus' uh, final prayer, or it's often called his high priestly prayer. So how far did we get? Uh, we did eight lessons. We got all the way through chapter 16, verse 4. So we've got to finish chapter 16 and then all of chapter 17. To complete the study. Um, so today we're not going to be beginning any new material. This is going to be a, 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 a recap of what we studied over the first eight lessons. Um, I'll be honest, this, this, preparing for this has been so challenging. Uh, all the previous lessons were, you know, focused on a narrow portion of the scripture, really dive into all the details. Uh, we can't do that today, right? So we're really, what we're trying to do is we're not going to be looking at everything verse by verse like we will do with the remaining lessons. Today is more, let's get an idea of the big picture. Uh, what, what, is, what is Jesus trying to tell the disciples and, and basically help, help step, set the stage and the context for what we're gonna learn throughout the rest of the study. Um, if you are interested, the, the previous eight lessons were recorded. Uh, so we got a video recorded today. Um, they were recorded, they're on the church's website, they're on the church's YouTube page. Um, so if you're interested, you can go uh, check out the detailed lessons there. Uh, so again, uh, the farewell discourse, uh, like I said, Jesus is with the disciples uh, at the Last Supper, the night before his crucifixion. Um, just a little bit about, about the book of John. You know, uh, this discourse is, is uh, unique to the Gospel of John. Uh, if you actually look at the time from the Last Supper to, to Gethsemane, um, the amount of time that the other gospel writers devote to that snippet of time is no more than 25 verses in each gospel. And John has five entire chapters, uh, which is really what, what we're studying. Um, John also, uh, you know, if you think about him being the author of this, uh, I think it's pretty safe to say out of the gospel writers, John was the closest to Jesus during his earthly ministry. He and Matthew were disciples, uh, but we know John was was part of the inner circle, if you will, with Peter and his brother James uh, among the disciples. And John 13 actually tells us John is sitting next to Jesus. 
here at the Last Supper. So what a privilege we have that, that we get to step in the upper room the last night of Jesus' life here on earth before he's crucified and hear what he has to tell the disciples. Sets a stage for, uh, this is probably important stuff, right? That's why we're studying it. As we begin, um, I started the last, our first lesson off last time talking about this. Remember, we were approaching these verses post-crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. We, we, we are reading these verses from that perspective. That's not the perspective from which the disciples are hearing these words from Jesus, right? So they did not yet possess a full understanding of everything that's going to happen. And that's what Jesus is trying to explain to them, trying to prepare them for what's going to happen. And what is completely evident, and it blows me away every time I look at these verses, that Jesus is love for them. He's the one that's about to be crucified, right? He's the one that's about to go to the cross. Uh, he knows he's about to go to the cross in less than 24 hours. Yet he's so patient with them. He's so gracious with them. Uh, wanting to make sure that they are prepared for what's going to come next. What, what they'll need to do. Not only is he, is he uh, showing love to them, his sovereignty is on full display. Uh, he is very much in control of what's happening. This isn't something that's just happening to Jesus. He's fully aware of what's going to happen. And he's in control of what's going to happen as well. So if we begin, well, we'll look a little bit at John chapter 13 to uh, kind of set the stage for the discourse in John uh, 14. So at the beginning of the chapter, uh, John basically tells us where we are it's before the feast of the, pa uh, the, feast of the Passover. Uh, Jesus is with his disciples. They're at the Last Supper. Uh, through verse 20, uh, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And then beginning in verse 21, uh, Jesus predicts that one of the disciples is going to betray him. They all look around at each other, you know, in bewilderment. Surely not me, mm -hmm. right? Um, G Peter gets John's attention, who's sitting next to Jesus, says, Hey, you know, find out who he's talking about. So John leans over and asks, asks Jesus who it's going to be. Jesus says, it's, it's the one whom I take the, the morsel of bread, dip it, and give it to. Uh, Jesus then does that. He hands it to Judas, and Judas takes the morsel. Uh, scripture then says Satan enters Judas after that happens. And uh, Jesus uh, looks at Judas and says, what you do, do quickly. It wasn't a suggestion. <laughs> it, wasn't a, it, wasn't, it was a command. What you do, do quickly. And immediately Judas gets up to leave the room um, to what we know is to go basically portray Jesus. Set up, get the Roman soldiers, they'll meet them in Gethsemane and turn Jesus over to the authorities. Um, John is quick, but it's, it's also clear to point out that the disciples did not know what Jesus was telling Judas to go do, right? So he wasn't aware. They weren't aware that Judas was in fact going to betray him. Um, and so after Judas leaves the room, that's, that's where our study began. Our first lesson actually covered the last eight verses in chapter 13. Um, so as, as Judas leaves the room, Jesus is there with his remaining 11 disciples, all right? And then he, uh, essentially the discourse begins. Uh, he begins before he instructs them or gives them any, um, addresses them directly even. He gives them this quick statement on uh, glorification. It says, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Uh, if you read throughout the book of John, uh, there will be several times where John will say, you know, Jesus was not seized by the authorities, or he didn't go to this town to do this. Because his hour had not yet come. It was not time yet for him to be glorified. Here Jesus says, now that time has come. I also think its placement is very key. Judas, which basically what Judas just left to go do, was not intended to bring glory to Jesus. Was not intended to bring glory to the Father. Jesus is saying that the crucifixion, the plans that Judas just went to go execute, which will result in the crucifixion of me, that's not the end, right? In fact, it will have the exact intended effect. Uh, it, will, it will be used to bring glory to me, glory to my Father, even more so than, than, than imaginable. Right? Mm -hmm. Then he tells the disciples he's leaving them. And where he's going, they cannot come. Uh, he then gives them a new commandment to love one another as he has loved them. Uh, Peter, I don't think, heard a word of that because he immediately goes back to Jesus' departure. Says, Peter, Peter asks Jesus where he's going. 
And Jesus says again, where I'm going, you cannot come. But he clarifies, you will follow later. Uh, that answer did not satisfy Peter. Um, he said, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. What an ironic statement. Right? Uh, and Jesus, maybe with a hint of sarcasm, says, will you lay down your life for me? Um, in fact, you will deny you know me three times before morning. And then the chapter ends. Right? I mean, you can imagine the disciples are uh, probably pretty distraught at this point. Uh, they just found out one of them is going to betray him, betray Jesus. Um, Jesus is leaving, and then their leader, Peter, will deny even knowing Jesus before morning. Perhaps they're picking up the breadcrumbs along the way that all three of those things are related. And so when Jesus said before morning, it probably alerted them to the immediacy of his departure, how quickly all these things are going to happen. So John 13 ends, and the discourse begins in chapter 14, but when John 13 ends, there's got to be a lot of questions on the disciples' mind, right? Number one, where is, where is Jesus leaving? Why is he leaving? What's his purpose? What's he going to go do? Uh, why, can't they, why can't the disciples come? What, what does that Jesus' departure mean for the disciples? What role will Jesus have in their lives after he is gone? What will the disciples do after he is gone? Remember, these men have dropped everything to follow Jesus during his, during his three years of ministry. They've, they've dropped everything, so what are they going to do after Jesus is gone? He just told them to love like he loved them. What does that mean? What does Jesus' love look like? And then how will the rest of the world react or respond to the disciples after Jesus is gone? So Jesus graciously answers all those questions in mm -hmm. chapter 14, 15, and 16. And uh, we're going to look at many of those today. So again, the goal here is to get a big picture uh, and really answer all those questions to help prepare us for the rest of the study. Before I move on, any questions or comments? I've been talking a lot. <laughs> all right. So first, where is Jesus going? In John chapter 14, Jesus begins by clarifying his destination. He is going to the Father. And while he is there, he's going to prepare a place for the disciples in the Father's house. And if he prepares a place for them, then he will return from them. So that in his words, where I am, there you also will be. And Jesus also clarifies the way to the Father. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you're ever feeling less valuable or not good about yourself, read these verses. They apply to you as well. Um, so during our lesson on these verses, we spent half the class looking at verse 2 alone, uh, specifically looking at Jesus' choice of words, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. Um, we spent a lot of time on that, trying to get an idea of what sort of message, uh, what sort of picture is Jesus trying to paint uh, to the disciples. Uh, we talked a lot about ancient Israel society, uh, which was a patriarchal <coughs> tribal culture. And in Israel, the patriarch, uh, he had authority over his family or a clan. Uh, it was usually larger, more like an extended family. Uh, he enforced law and he was responsible <coughs> for the well-being, their well-being. Uh, this, this clan typically included his wife or wives, his unwed children, his married sons, and their families, sometimes up to 30 people. Glad we don't do that today. Uh, and they would typically live together in what was more or less a family compound. So think of a walled enclosure with individual dwelling units inside of there. So the father's house, dwelling units, and my father's house are many dwelling places. We think Jim, Jesus is using that imagery to paint a picture. Uh, to the disciples. And there they would collectively farm the land and share in the produce. So uh, we also talked a little bit about the firstborn son of the patriarch, why he was so important in Israelite society, is because he would become the next patriarch, right? So he, he that's why if you, you've read scripture, you might have heard the term double, double portion. The firstborn would get a double portion to ensure he had adequate resources he needed to take over for the patriarch. Um, we also, uh, the last thing we talked about was the word redemption, to really get a fuller picture of what Jesus may be trying to convey here. The word redemption was actually a secular term in ancient Israel, not a theological term. 
is where a patriarch would place his own resources on the line to ransom a lost family member back to the father's house, back inside the kinship circle. So here Jesus is certainly talking about a real physical place, right? He's in my father's house are many dwelling places. He's talking about a real place that he is going to. But I think his description of that place was likely not intended to physically describe what that place looked like, but more convey relational implications. The disciples probably picked up on that imagery like, whoa, we're being, we're being brought to the family of God. Man, <clears throat> he has a place for us, and he's bringing us in. We get to live under the patriarch Yahweh, and it goes even deeper than that. If we think about that act of redemption, there's really two elements to it. There's a relational side of it, and then the physical side of it. So here, Jesus confirms the relational side of redemption here on earth. That's what he's doing with the disciples right now. And then Jesus promises to return to fully consummate that act of redemption by bringing, us, bringing the disciples physically to the Father's house. But here and now, they and we can rest assured that the Father's house is our destination. That's where we're going. Our place in the Father's house, our status as adopted children of God, as co-heirs with this firstborn of all creation, is, is set, it's done, it's secured. That's who we are. Jesus is assuring you, you have a place in the family of God. You are coming back with me. You are being co-heir with me. Um, at the end of the day, we're going to be together. So even though I'm leaving you now, the relational side of redemption your status in the Father's house is, is done. It's secure. Use that as the foundation of everything else I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, right? We will be together. And He will return to where He is. We may also be. What a beautiful picture, right? So, Jesus gets that out of the way, uh, comforts them by those words, assures them of their place with Him. The natural question is, uh, next, is why are the disciples being left behind? Um, we get a picture of that in John 14, 12, where Jesus uh, says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. We're going to expound on this in a minute. But we see that Jesus intends the disciples to continue his work while he is gone. But that begs the question, how on earth can the disciples do Jesus' work if Jesus is not there? They've been leaning on him. He's been teaching them. He's been guiding them the, the whole time that they've been following him. How on earth can they do that if Jesus is no longer around? He says, I assure you, I will not leave you as orphans. Right? First, he says, um, I'm going to see you after a little while. Referencing his post-resurrection appearances. And he says, because I live, you will also live. So in addition to promising the disciples' own resurrection, Jesus' resurrection, of course, will demonstrate the validation of his claims, God's satisfaction in him and his sacrifice, and also his ability to fulfill the promises of his return that he just gave them. Right? Secondly, the Father is going to send the Helper, the Holy Spirit. Right? So we know Jesus, when he is resurrected, He'll stay on the earth for 40 days. He'll ascend to heaven. And then at Pentecost, uh, the Holy Spirit will come. Jesus tells the disciples about that here. And he gives, Jesus gives us lots of clues about who the Spirit is, uh, what sort of role he'll have in the disciples' life uh, in the farewell discourse. First, who is the Spirit? Jesus calls the Spirit another helper, meaning he is like Jesus, who is the first helper. The Father sends him in Jesus' name, meaning he has the same authority as Jesus. He calls him the Spirit of Truth, just after he called himself the truth. He is of truth, just as he, uh, he and the Father are of truth. So what is the relationship between the Spirit and the disciples? First, the Spirit is given to believers only, only those who believe in Jesus. Uh, the world cannot receive this gift. The Spirit will take a permanent residence in the believer, and by the Spirit... Jesus and the Father will dwell in the believer. So no longer will the presence of God be manifest in the temple, but rather inside each individual believer. So what role will Spirit play in the life of the disciples? Specifically, Jesus states the following about the Spirit. The Spirit will remind the disciples of Jesus' words. 
He'll teach the disciples. He'll testify about Jesus to and through the disciples. Next week, I don't want to spoil it, the Spirit's role is going to be clarified even further. I'm not going to mention it now. So Jesus is leaving and the Spirit is coming. So we go back to what will the disciples do uh, after Jesus is gone. Their place in heaven is secure. Jesus says, I have work for you to do here. I'm going to send a helper to assist you in doing that work. What does that work look like? Let's go back to 1412. They will continue his work. So Jesus says, they will continue his work and do even greater works than these. He then promises in the following verses, verses 13 and 14, that he will intercede for believers in prayer to help them do that work. Why? So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. I'll ask you guys, what does Jesus mean when he says, greater works than these you will do? Any thoughts? Reach more people. Exactly. I think that's it. Yeah. I think the obvious is no one is greater than Jesus. And no work is greater than what Jesus accomplished in his death and resurrection. Um, so think of magnifying his ministry, right? We know when Jesus appeared uh, to the disciples after uh, the resurrection, uh, he, he doesn't intend his message to stay for his message to stay in Jerusalem, right? Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations. Acts 1 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then what? You should be my witnesses. Where? Jude Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Merrill Longer says the greater works are possible because our Lord in the flesh was confined to one place at a time. Now with that poor spirit, all that Jesus began to do and to teach can be continued worldwide by his faithful followers. So how will believers perform greater works than these? By prayer in Jesus' name. We continue to work in Jesus, armed with the gospel, with Jesus as our intercessor, and the Spirit as our guide. Amen. There's also a sense of maybe a greatness and privilege. Uh, we are privileged to do the, this, to do Jesus' work after he's gone to heaven, after he's there to intercede for us, after the Spirit has come as well. That's the first thing we're going to do. The second thing, we'll go back to Jesus' first piece of instruction. It said they will love like Jesus loves. What does that mean? Unconditionally. Unconditionally, that's great. What else? Why does he call it a new commandment? Is to love one another even as I have loved you. Thoughts? Part of the new covenant. Yeah, definitely. Have we, have we seen love like Jesus before? We're going to look at a few, a few examples of this. So what Jesus does, he begins the discourse by saying, love one another even as I have loved you. And then he says several times, in the discourse what that love looks like. So he'll say, if you love me, the first one we're going to look at, you will obey my commandments. Mm -hmm. So he's teaching them how to love like he loves. Right? He's expanding on that first piece of instruction. So in John 14, 15, he says that, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so if we're loving like Jesus loves, that means he is loved in the same way. Right? John 14, 31, Jesus did this perfectly. He says, so the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father has commanded me. So we're following his example when we obey his commandments. Practically, how does obeying Jesus show love to him? It shows our commitment. It shows your commitment, absolutely. Commitment to what? Mm-hmm. <coughs> what else? It's, uh, it takes self out of the picture. Mm -hmm. puts God. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can we say that to each other? If you love right hey, hey Pat, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. <laughs> <laughs> we can't say it to each other. <laughs> <laughs> So when we show love by obedience, we're demonstrating trust and confidence in Jesus. 
Jesus. That he knows what is right, what is best. Um, I think about the maybe the negative side of that is when we confess our sin, we're acknowledging that Jesus is right about our wrongdoing. Right? We're acknowledging that we are in the wrong and he is in the right. When we obey, it's, it's kind of the opposite of that. We're acknowledging Jesus is right and then we're doing <laughs> what he said, what he said we should do. And note that verse 15 on obedience is sandwiched between verses 13 and 14 on prayer, the promise of Jesus that he will intercede for us in prayer, verses 16 and 17, which talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit. We are not powerless against sin. We can obey his commandments. That's possible. He's going to give us all the tools we need to walk with him. Um, God gives us the capacity and the tools for obedience for love. And on the flip side, uh, we should not expect the blessings of answered prayer, expect to do kingdom work or fellowship with the Spirit if we are not walking in obedience. Jesus is going to build on this later when he talks about bearing fruit. All right, another example of love. John 14, 28. It says, if you love me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, but the Father is greater than I. So here we can get a couple of principles about Jesus' love. Number one, in a general sense, you know, wanting the best for Jesus is, is, is loving to, to Him. We can apply that practically, generally, to wanting the best for others, seeing to the best of others, um, is a demonstration of love. But I think the bigger picture here is wanting to see Jesus glorified is, is a way we can express our love to Him. Mm -hmm. right? Desiring to see Him exalted lifted up, glorified. Jesus returning to the Father means, means the end of His humiliation here on earth. His return to glory at the right hand of the Father. The disciples here right now, I think He's rebuking them a little bit because their grief to this point has really been uh, selfish. It's been focused on their own grief about what it meant for them that Jesus was leaving. They were not considering what that meant for Jesus that He was leaving. Right. So another principle of Jesus' love we obey Him, we also seek His glory, seek to see Him exalted in everything we do. And of course, Jesus, He exemplified that perfectly to the Father. If you look in John chapter 17, He begins His prayer asking the Father to glorify the Son. Why? So the Son may glorify you. Right? So that, that's what Jesus sought to do with everything He did. We should do the same. And then the last one we'll talk about is John chapter 15, 13. Jesus says, Greater love hath no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. I think we could say Jesus, uh, he uh, certainly, certainly practiced what he preached right there. Uh, he did that to the utmost uh, when he laid down his life for us on the cross. Um, but does that, mean, does that mean we should do the same for each other? What's, what's, what's more uh, common? Us having to literally lay down our lives for someone, a fellow believer, or live, you know, loving each other sacrificially, laying down our, our, our time, yeah. our, our resources, um, giving of ourselves. I would argue the majority of us, that is how uh, the most common way we can express that love to each other is a sacrificial <coughs> love, a self-sacrificial love. Mm -hmm. so. I want to say something about the Sacrifice of the Bible that's a new Yeah. Going back, going back to Matthew 22, when, when the lawyer asked Jesus to love two greatest commandments, the second thing is love your neighbor as yourself. Yep. And he said, love your love and love is I love Jesus. Did you ever see it? Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's